Okay, so we have data, data points characterized by features. Feature is what you can measure easily using a simple sensor, a temperature sensor, or everything you can uh, read out from a snapshot, like red, green, blue values of a pixel. And you have a label or a quantity of interest that comes with each data point. So first component, data. Uh, second component, uh, as you correctly said, a model. So what do we do in machine learning? In machine learning, we want to learn a hypothesis, which is, in the end, mathematically, the, the most difficult mathematical concepts in machine learning are sets and functions. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, these are the most basic concepts in all of mathematics. So uh, there's not really a surprise here. Uh, but uh, technically, all, all machine learning revolves around learning a function, a hypothesis function that reads in the feature of a data point and outputs a prediction or guess for the label. And we hope to find a hypothesis, so we must have more than one hypothesis, and the set of all hypotheses is called a model or a hypothesis space. We want to find the specific hypothesis out of this model that, has, that is optimal in some sense, and here comes in the third component of machine learning, which is the loss function. The loss function is anything that allows to tell you how good is a certain hypothesis. So we can say this is the first hypothesis, and we can say the loss is uh, 10. Here, the second hypothesis has loss uh, 20. No, and then it seems natural to pick the hypothesis with the smallest loss. Uh, yeah, and the thing now is uh, machine learning methods use different design choices. So we can use different features of data points. Features could be the presence of a certain keyword in a text or could be the frequency of the letter E in the text. So it's up to you how you construct the feature. The label is also a design choice. It's up to you to some extent as a machine learning engineer how you break down a machine learning application into a, a, a choice for the label. You have design choices there. And uh, today we talk about uh, ethical aspects of these design choices. And also the loss, by the way. How you construct the loss is uh, a design choice that might have relevance for the trustworthiness of a machine learning method. So, and now, I mean, today I'm, I'm leaving my home turf, so to say. So I was trained as an electrical engineer. Uh, in the end, it's applied mathematics or statistics. So I know something, or maybe hopefully a bit more than the average student, <coughs> about computational properties of a model and statistical properties. So how uh, uh, statistical properties, I mean, can you say that you find a good hypothesis at all in a given model for a specific data set? For example, for this data set, is it a good choice to use a linear model? So these I mean the statistical aspects. Then there are also computational aspects that uh, correspond to like how much computation do you need to find the best hypothesis. And this both the statistical and the computational properties of the overall machine learning method depend on all the uh, design choices for the model, the data representation, and the loss. So with these design choices, you trade computational complexity against statistical accuracy and vice versa. However, today I leave this. This is my domain. This is my research domain. So my, my research revolves around finding out how much computation do you need to find the best hypothesis in a given model. And statistical aspects, is, the best, is this best hypothesis any good on new data points? Or how, how robust is it? So this is my research domain. But recently I started a new line of research, and that's also why I have hired Diana as a new PhD student with a law background. Because in the end, we must always be aware that the key component of machine learning, and this might now shock you because I, I tried to burn into your brains that we have three main components, but these are the three main components of a nerd. Me as a nerd who likes to develop and analyze uh, machine learning uh, uh, methods, but in the end, the main component of machine learning is the human user. The mach machine learning is just a tool set, uh, tools to help us. Machine learning must revolve around us and not the other way around. And there's currently a, 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 a or attention in this because when you look around, when you sit in the, 
In the metro, for example, when you look around the people, I guess 99% of people sit like this. So they sit in front of their smartphones and they are kind of uh, made addicted to looking at the smartphone by recommendation algorithms that point you to new content that you should check out. So to some extent, we revolve already around the machine learning and we should counteract this. And one way to counteract this is first to become clear about criteria or values of trustworthy machine learning. And yeah, uh, let me highlight again, this is not my home turf. So this is now for me also a, a learning experience. So I learned something while I teach you here, uh, trustworthy machine learning. So wh what my approach now was is I, I was pointed to this ethics guidelines by the European Union. So Diana pointed uh, me to this interesting document. And uh, what I like about these uh, guidelines is they broke it down to seven points to seven key requirements, and I like this. You have a list of key requirements, and then you go through it, requirement by requirement, step by step. So that seemed appealing to me as an engineer who likes recipes uh, to do something. So I will now try to go over this, uh, this seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven aspects or requirements that the European Union set out or, or proposed so not the European Union, it was uh, more specifically, uh, how was it called? Uh, High, level high level expert group. And so the first thing should then always be uh, check out who sits in the high level expert group. So if the high level expert group is constituted by Google managers and Amazon managers, then you should be a bit more careful. But I must say when I read through it, uh, it seems reasonable. So uh, these uh, proposals resonate with me, although uh, I didn't study too much uh, the background and the incentives of this high-level expert group. Okay, so let's start with, yeah, just uh, let me read it first. The seven key requirements for, for trustworthy machine learning or trustworthy AI. So I use AI and ML interchangeably uh, here. Uh, so this means necessarily we only look at the small aspect of AI methods, in particular those which are, I call machine learning. Uh, so the seven key, seven key requirements of European, uh, the European values for trustworthy machine learning are first, human agency and oversight. Second, the technical robustness and safety. Third, the privacy and data governance. Fourth, the transparency. Fifth, the diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. Sixth, the societal and environmental well-being, and seventh, the accountability. And I will now try to, to interpret these this key requirements using the tools that we have built up in this course. And these tools mainly revolve around design choices, specifically design choices for data, for the model, so the set of, of hypothesis spaces, and for the loss function. So I will show you how these design choices could be are made to satisfy or to fulfill these key requirements. Yes, so let's start with the first one, human agency and oversight. So this here are, are, are quotes. Uh, I, I use a lot of quotes from this uh, document provided by the European Union, this uh, ethics guideline. So I highly recommend you to have a look at it yourself. So for human agency, this document says, the overall principle of user autonomy must be central to the system's functionality. Key to this is the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing where this produces legal effects on users or similarly significantly affects them. So what this uh, could mean for this here is that in the design choice for the label. So the label should not be like a, a final, final court decision. So you could say a court case is a data point. A court case is a data point. And what are the features of a court case? What can we measure? What can we uh, determine easily for a court case? Well, anything that is called evidence. So what, what legal people call evidence, I think is, is pretty much what I call a features. So this is uh, objective knowledge. like written documents, uh, short messages sent via the chancellor's smartphone in Austria, for example. This is all evidence. 
And the, so a court case could then be a, a data point where the quantity of interest is, or more simply, guilty or not guilty. So you want to predict if a person is guilty or not guilty. And uh, what this says, human agency, is that this decision should not be directly fed into the police system, which then uh, gets the prediction guilty, runs out, and puts our chancellor into chains. Unfortunately, this is not allowed. So human agency means uh, these predictions must not go directly in an automated fashion into actions, really actions like giving the police the command you have to give, I think you have to give the police the, a command to put somebody under arrest. Have to be feel. So there must be a, a human in between, between this final step. And the human might be a, how do you call, a Staatsanwalt, a attorney, prosecutor. a prosecutor. So this is uh, what I think uh, relates to human agency. So this label, this quantity of interest must not directly lead to real actions. Yeah, another example might be where this is not so clear, when this uh, quantity of interest, so a data point could be a, a driving situation of a Tesla car or some other, some other, uh, some other electrical or self-driving car. So this here corresponds to a certain situation, so a certain time point during the drive, and the quantity of interest could be the optimal steering angle of the car. Yeah, and, but, but here, by definition, if you have a self-driving car, the steering angle must be, should be used. I mean, it's, it should drive itself. So you use the steering angle. So in this case, you have little human agency. And I guess, to, 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 uh, are there already court cases uh, for self-driving cars who co uh, which caused an accident? There are some in the making right now, but they're not decided. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, m more uh, of a border case here for self-driving cars, to have sufficient human agency. Yes, so the next requirement is referred to as human oversight. And this, yeah, so in our setting, this means you are the, the human machine learning engineer. You are the one who chooses the loss function, the model, and the, the, the training data. So it's under your control. You have the design choices. Yeah, and the, then there are these this fancy passwords, human in the loop. Uh, this refers to the capability for human uh, intervention in every decision cycle of the system, uh, which in many cases is neither possible nor desirable. So here's the term decision cycle, and I would call this rather a learning cycle. So you, we have different learning cycles in machine learning. One learning cycle is, is the, the lowest level. On the lowest level, a learning cycle means going over the hypothesis in the hypothesis space and trying out to find better and better hypotheses. And this is typically done very fast. What's the, the single most widely used algorithm to do this, to implement this, this, most, uh, uh, this uh, learning cycle on the, most, uh, on the finest level or on the, on the shortest time interval? There's one optimization method used to do this in, in most machine learning algorithms. Gradient descent, yes. Gradient descent. Whenever you do a gradient descent step or a gradient step, you complete one new learning cycle. And these gradient steps, they are done on the range of um, uh, fractions of seconds. So I don't know what is the fastest, 10 to the minus 6 seconds for one gradient step or even faster. And uh, I mean, that's the whole point of machine learning, to not have a human checking each gradient step. Yes, this was a good gradient step. No, this was not a good gradient step. So this is what we want to automate. But this is only one cycle. So the, this is the training, the model training, where we find the best model. Then there's another cycle, which is based on another criterion, not on the training error. So the training error on the training set is used to guide these gradient steps, this learning cycle of finding the best hypothesis in a model. But then there is a second step uh, on a higher level, which is this higher level step. First, we look for the best hypothesis within a model. But then we also can and typically do not only use one model, but different models. And the choosing between these different models 
is based on which error? Validation error, yes. And when you evaluate validation errors of different methods and choose one method, do model selection based on the validation error, you do another learning cycle. But this is on a, on a slower pace. So you have two learning cycles, one using, for example, gradient descent for each model, and then a larger one uh, doing model selection. And this model selection could mean, for example, also hyperparameter tuning or uh, uh, enlarging your neural network, making it a bit larger, making it a bit smaller. And in this model selection cycle, uh, as, you, as you work on your project, this is done by you. So there is the human, there is the human in the loop. Oh, we have a nice abbreviation here, so let's use it. Hippo. Oh, this is a not so nice abbreviation. <laughs> at least for German Austrians. <coughs> Hit, uh, H I T L. <coughs> Hitler. No, yeah. Okay. So, and here we have the here we have the human. So here is no human. Here is no human. And here is the human in the model selection cycle. And then there's also something called human on the loop. Uh, yeah, refers to the capability for human intervention during the design cycle and monitoring the system operation. So I would say that human on the loop is then uh, one step higher. So after model selection, how do we diagnose or, or monitor the system operation? Then, there we need this third type of data set. So we use the validation sets to compare, to uh, change or uh, select different between different models. And then when we have chosen a final model, you still need to permanently observe the behavior. Uh, so the, as a rule of thumb, the learning cycle never ends. It's continuous learning all the time. So you have selected a model that works best on your project data. So how do you know if this uh, finally selected model is good? You try it out on a test set. Yes. So on a, then you try it out on a test set. And based on the test set, in the very end, you say, OK, this error on the test set is too high, so it's not good. So let's restart the whole loop again and come up with a, a different uh, ensemble of candidate models. OK, then we have human in command, which uh, refers to the capability to oversee the overall activity of an AI system including its broader economic, societal, legal, and ethical impact, and the ability to decide when and how to use the system in any particular situation. So this, I would say, refers... Uh, so this, uh, all uh, terms here of, of human intervention is mainly engineering. So uh, doing the training with gradient descent, doing model selection, uh, uh, using human in the loop, human on the loop, then evaluating the final test set. And this human in command, I think, is, is more broader perspective. So what are you doing with the machine learning algorithm? Uh, for example, are you trying to profile uh, Facebook users for their political uh, preferences? And then based on them, recommend certain uh, news articles to them. And I guess this human in command refers to the ability to evaluate these problems. And at least uh, in Europe, it, it worked. So there was this Cambridge Analytica scandal a few years ago, or is it still ongoing? So there were, there, it seems there were some human in command. Wh which humans are, do you think are those which check these broader impacts? Which, or which professions, which jobs are uh, uh, considered this hu uh, human in command, if the human is in command? What, what are, the, what are the, the, the critiques of applications of, tech, of technology? Yes? Like, you mean from a technical point of view? Or? No, in general, as a society. Who checks if this human in command? So, uh, as I said, this goes beyond engineering. So, I, as a machine learning engineer or a data scientist, I don't really have time, or maybe as a hobby, to verify if the human is in command. But which, which group of people checks if, if we humans are in command? Yeah, researchers should be, but also uh, journalists. So I guess that's why we should have a free press uh, to report about possible negative wider impacts 
that go beyond individual research fields. Because we as a scientists, we often are, are driven by, by our own uh, field and, and the needs of our own research field. But there should be somebody who checks the, the broader impact. And I guess for this, we need journalists, uh, good journalists, critical journalists. Yeah, has anybody of you heard about the Panama Papers? So I guess this was also mainly a, a data collection initiative of journalists, also as a part of, of, saying, uh, of checking if, if we humans are in command. Okay, uh, are there any questions regarding human agency and oversight? Next requirement, technical robustness. Yeah, and th this is, I mean, this is easy. This is one of the easiest requirements to discuss for me because uh, robustness, we have uh, looked at, uh, for example, in regularization. So uh, uh, this uh, guideline, European guideline tells us AI must cope with changes in operating environment or presence of other agents, human or artificial, that may interact with the system in an adversarial manner. And one way to interact in an adversarial manner is to for example, uh, flip a few pixels in images uh, in order to fool, to fool deep neural networks that have been trained in a good intention. So these deep neural networks have been trained by researchers which didn't have anything bad in mind and uh, they made their research freely available. So some public institution like Kela, Social Insurance Institute of Finland, thought, okay, we can use this for some automated processing of documents. So we use this deep neural network structure uh, but then there might be some agents, let's call them agents, that uh, want to fool this classification algorithms and just flip a few pixels. So the, the Kela algorithm then uh, interpret the images wrong or classify it wrong, and this might lead, for example, that you, that you get uh, higher benefit payments, roughly speaking. So, uh, but here you see why uh, these uh, regularization techniques are, are good and useful, because we can robustify machine learning methods. For example, as I have told you, by, by augmenting data sets. So by not only using uh, the few cherry-picked data points in your training set, but adding a bit of noise. So wobbling around, adding a bit of noise, adding a bit of, of transformations, rotating images. Uh, in, in, in general, applying any transformation to the feature vector that keeps the label uh, unchanged. So label, we call this label preserving uh, transformation. Like if you flip a few pixels of, an, of an, a unicorn on a horse, horse image, then it should be still a horse image. Or similarly, if you rotate, if you look at the horse from a different angle, it's still a horse image. And these symmetries can be used to make the machine learning method more robust. Just uh, clone the data points, the original blue training data points, by applying some of these transformations to them. And you get more data points in your training set. Okay, then next uh, requirement, or ne next aspect of this robustness requirement, uh, a fallback plan. So it says, this can mean that AI systems switch from a statistical to rule-based procedure, or they ask uh, for a human operator before continuing their action. Yeah, and how can we implement this fallback plan? Well, to implement the fallback, you need to know when to fall back. Otherwise, uh, the fallback plan doesn't work. And one way to implement such a fallback plan is not only make predictions of a label itself, but also for the confidence. And this idea I have told you in one of the first lectures. In which method did we use this idea? To not only predict the label value itself, but also the confidence in this prediction. What's the most simple machine learning method that uses this idea? Classification, a classification method, yes. Which one? Binary. In binary classification, yes. Which binary classification method uses this? Logistic regression. Because in logistic regression, we learn a, a real valued number or a, a linear hypothesis which we then use to to predict by thresholding so we compare h of x larger than zero then we predict y hat one if otherwise 
otherwise y hat minus 1. And the absolute value of this function we use as a confidence measure. And if this absolute value is very small, <clears throat> like uh, let's say it's 10 to the minus 10, so very low confidence, then we might do a fallback. Then we might say, okay, this doesn't work. This uh, learning uh, uh, a hypothesis for a classifier doesn't work, so let's use some other rule, like uh, a pre-specified rule, for example, which tells when x is larger than 5, predict y hat 1. If not, predict y hat minus 1. This is uh, what they refer here with a rule-based procedure. Rule-based procedure. Uh, by the way, uh, this rule-based procedure is also a special case of the machine learning methods that I have taught you. Which one is it? Which machine learning method uses such rule-based descriptions of a hypothesis? that is, of a map from features to prediction? Decision trees. That's a decision tree. Or that can be represented by a decision tree. But this decision tree doesn't need to be learned. So uh, this we could, uh, in, in this case here, we use a decision tree with everything fixed. So this could be interpreted as a special case of a model that only contains one hypothesis. So there is no learning anymore, but we hope that this one single hypothesis that we get, so this decision tree or rule-based procedure, makes sense. How can we make sure? Well, uh, we must trust that the one who, who specified this procedure did a good job, but there is no learning anymore. Okay, next aspect. When uh, accuracy, when occasional inaccurate predictions cannot be avoided, it is important that the system can indicate how likely these errors are. A high level of accuracy is especially crucial in situations where the AI system directly uh, affects human life. So this is also related to the confidence measures. So looking at the, at the absolute value of the hypothesis in logistic regression, and this you can do uh, conveniently in Python using these predict probability functions. So looking uh, the prediction itself, so here we use the logistic regression class. The prediction itself here, this function, does the, the final classification. So it compares the, the value of this hypothesis with some threshold and outputs either 1 or minus 1. Or here in this case, 0 and 1, which are different encodings of binary labels. But then you should always look at the, the confidence measure. And, and in Python, you get these confidence measures using predict probability. So this is not directly uh, the absolute value of this function, but some uh, monotone transformation. Because uh, probabilities should be values between 0 and 1. And this absolute value here can be anything from 0 to infinity. But the, the, it's, it's monotonic. So the larger this absolute value, the larger the probability measures are, or confidence in the prediction. Yes, another aspect is that it is critical that the results of AI systems are reproducible as well as reliable. A reliable AI system is one that works properly with a range of inputs and at a range of situations. So uh, being, being robust against uh, feature, noise in features, is covered by data augmentation methods or, or uh, regularization. But we could also say we want the whole system to be robust against different training sets. So this is a, on a different level. Robustness on a different level. So we want reliability for a learned hypothesis that it doesn't change too quickly with uh, uh, small variations in the features. So we cannot get fooled by single pixel attacks. This is one form of robustness or reliability. Another form of reliability is we should be reliable, uh, 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 we should be robust against different choices of the training set. And this is what you can study using uh, this bias variance analysis, in particular using the variance. So when you, when you have a large data set, randomly select a small subset and use as a training set. And then you repeat this several times. And so in each repetition, you choose a different subset as the training set, you learn a different Hypothesis typically, but the variation should not be too large. If the variation is too large, if the variance is too large, then this typically tells you either you have too little training data or you, you try to fit a too large model. 
And how can you, how can you counteract this? How can you reduce the variance of a machine learning method? Either by first option, there are always two options. First option, we can work on the data. Get more data or augment the data. Second option, work on the model size. Make the model smaller. For example, using smaller neural networks or using uh, uh, smaller decision trees, shallower decision trees. There is a, typically a max depth parameter for decision trees, and choosing this parameter smaller makes your model smaller. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, are there any questions regarding this uh, technical robustness and safety requirement? So this is, I would say, this is what, what is most close to my, my, my home domain of, uh, of statistical machine learning, robustness. So this is related to regularization techniques and data augmentation. Next, next point, uh, privacy and data governance. So now, now I'm, I'm on shaky ground because I have the expert here in the audience. <laughs> Maybe I should ask you, would, would you like to take over? <laughs> but please correct me. Uh, <clears throat> then, for privacy and data protection, it says digital records of human behavior may allow AI systems to infer not only individuals' preferences, but also their sexual orientation, age, gender, religious, religious or political views, to allow individuals to trust uh, the data. Uh, so, I don't know. Yes, so... It's important to, to be very careful with using features. Uh, and I like to think about this as, uh, as private features or private labels. So uh, in our picture, this means that a data point has different types of labels. And uh, one label, Y, I'll call it the public label, would be here in this application, uh, the food preference. So we want to know if a certain person uh, likes food or not but we would not like to find out, we don't need to find out the gender, we don't care, we just want to sell pizzas to anybody. Uh, so we could say we want to find a hypothesis that allows to predict well the public label, but does not allow to, uh, to predict the, the private label. Or, uh, in, a, or in, in another way, we want to, to pre-process the features, we want to learn privacy-preserving features that allow to predict the public label, but do not allow anymore to, uh, to predict the, the private label. And uh, I have shown, using a simple probabilistic model, I think it was in section, section nine, 9 something of my book, of the email book, I have shown how to, how to uh, modify PCA to find a, a feature map so remember in PCA, in principal component analysis, we have a long raw feature vector and we compute a new short feature vector. And you can encode this uh, requirement that you should not be able to predict the private label from X into the construction of this uh, feature learning matrix. And uh, you get then uh, some closed form result. Uh, big surprise, it's uh, using an eigenvalue decomposition, but this eigenvalue decomposition is not only based on the sample covariance of C, but also on the correlations between C and the public label and the private label. So uh, bottom line here is there are ways to make this precise, this requirement, and to compute uh, feature learning methods that output uh, uh, like privacy preserving features. So instead of sharing the raw data, you then share this privacy preserving feature vector with some untrusted uh, machine learning party. Okay, so here in this case, by the way, yeah, let's look at this case. How could you think about uh, a feature learning? Let's say we want to learn a linear map. We want to learn a linear map that takes these original features X1 and X2 and maps it to a new feature, which is privacy preserving in the sense it doesn't allow to distinguish or uh, to detect the gender of a person, but it still allows to detect uh, the food preference of the person. Would you have some rough idea how we could do this? when we look at this toy data set.
Well, we could project the feature vector x of this toilet intercept, which is given by x1 and x2, towards a, a specific direction. Uh, in particular, we could project it uh, on this green direction. So this green, uh, this green arrow here represents a vector, a directional vector, w, and we just take the, the inner product of the original feature vector with this, and we get a new feature, which is the same for all data points that are aligned the red direction. So for different genders, we project onto the same value, but for different food preference, so if we move al around uh, along the green direction, we get different uh, feature, uh, we get a different value for the new feature. So that's one way to do privacy preserving feature learning. Any comments, questions here? Okay, then uh, another aspect is the quality and the integrity of data. And this basically refers to the fact that, yes, you come up with a choice for the features. You define your features and you define the label of a data point in your project, for example. Uh, who, who, can, who would like to share the definition of features in their project? Anybody? So let's look again at this example here. So a data point is a person and this features is, uh, features might be the, the weight and the, the height. So the, the physical parameters of the body of a person. And you, you define the properties. So you write down in your project report, as feature we use the weight and the height of a person. But then what you read in, the data set that you read in, in your data frame, the numbers, they might be noisy. So this might not be the true height and weight of a person. So the, the data set itself might be noisy already. It might, these values that you read in your data frame might not be exactly the quantity that you have in your mind or that you model. It's actually a modeling assumption. Choosing, defining the features is a, is a form of modeling. And it might be that the data that you read in is not really the true feature value, but it's noisy. But you don't know, actually. <clears throat> Similar with the label. We, ha we had now, uh, or I'm supervising a master thesis where a data point is a physical activity, like running for five minutes of a certain person, and the, the, the quantity of interest is how many calories did you burn during that activity? So, and we were, we were still thinking, how do we ever get labeled data? How do you get the reliable information about how many calories did a person burn when, five, when it does five minutes running? How do you measure? Is there anybody here from sports physiology? Yes? No, but uh, isn't that like a problem that could be solved simply for a empirical point of view? Like, you know, if you know, I don't know, how much people are burning weights, the amount of distance that they will run. Yeah. You don't actually need to kind of predict that. You can actually just do some calculations with that. How? Which calculations would you do? Like, if you know how much a person has moved, and maybe it's weight. Yeah. You Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you could share with me pointers to this, uh, to papers that use these calculations, I would be very interested. Yeah, I don't know because I also don't know if the if another person, let's say Alex B, with the same kilograms as me, the same height, but uh, not my not my twin, uh, would use would burn the same amount of calories as me. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and maybe as you were saying, uh, I could burn a little bit more uh, calories uh, for, for example, my sister. Or yeah. 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 So, so how, do you, how do you measure the calories burned during activity? Where do you get the true label? Actually, I want to say that if we are, uh, we want to reliable and um, lost our truth data, we can try this last of times, maybe for on the last of people. Yeah. Yeah, but this is all comparative. This is all comparing between different people. But where is the truth here? 
So, uh, I mean, I've heard, I mean, I discuss with this master students regularly, and he pointed out one way to measure this is by analyzing the, the breath. So the experts, the FC Barcelona team doctor, he or she uses, uh, might use masks where they measure the, the composition of the breath that comes out, uh, Lionel, or oh, came out Lionel Messi when he was still with Barcelona. And that's how you could measure it. But it's high, it, just to point out that it might be highly non-trivial to get the right label values for data points. So this is uh, related to the quality and integrity of data. Yes, then another aspect is the access to data. So you should have clear protocols how and who can access the data, uh, who and how can persons access the data. And this is done, for example, uh, in uh, GitHub. So how many of you use uh, GitHub? So it would be a good investment if you learn how to use GitHub. It seems to be widely used in software development. And in GitHub, so uh, as I understood, it's basically a web-based uh, file system. And uh, a GitHub repository is a folder. And you can specify explicitly who can access and uh, to what extent can the person access the folder. Well, this idea is not completely new. I guess this has been used since the early days of Unix or any, any computer system that supports several users. But just to point out that this is explicitly required, or one of the requirements of, for trustworthy AI. OK. Uh, next requirement, transparency. So uh, transparency consists of traceability, the data sets and the processes that yield the AI system's decision, including those of data gathering and data labeling, as well as the algorithms used, should be documented to the best possible, uh, should be documented. Yeah, and this is what you, what you learn or what I ask you to do in your projects. Writing down the report is exactly to uh, ensure traceability. Tell me, what are the data set, uh, what is the source of the data? How do you define the features and labels? Which models do you use? Uh, and so on and so forth. So this is traceability is covered by our student project. Okay, and now explainability. Uh, technical explainability requires that the decisions made by an AI system can be understood and traced by human beings. Moreover, trade-offs might have to be made between explainability and the accuracy. So, of course, this gives the question, or this raises the question, what is an explanation? Any suggestions? What is an explanation? What does it mean to explain? Well, that's a bit of a philosophical question, but I like to think about explaining as similar to teaching. So I'm now, what I do now in this very moment is to explain you trustworthy machine learning. So teaching is to explain. Uh, and in particular, uh, explaining, as I understand, is communicating information. I tell you something that you understand something. So after you completed my course, you should be able to understand uh, when somebody explains a machine learning method by telling you I use this type of data, I use this model and this type of loss function. So after my course, uh, after you have successfully completed my course, uh, you, can, or you can understand an explanation of a uh, machine learning method by just getting to know what or the explanation of a machine learning method amounts to basically specifying the data, specifying the model and specifying the loss function. However, this form of explanation you will only find satisfactory if you went to my course. So if not, if you have never heard about machine learning, never been to a university, uh, this explanation will you help a lot. So, for example, for you, an, an explanation of linear regression could be linear regression learns a linear hypothesis, so it searches over all linear maps, uh, to minimize the average squared error over the training set. So that's one explanation of the machine learning method, linear regression. Okay. So would you explain your little sibling, five-year-old sibling, uh, linear regression like this? Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, just to point out, yeah, the other point here is uh, the explanation, or if an explanation is useful, depends on the person 
who gets the explanation. So it's also user specific. So you, as a, a student of the elite class of students of my courses, uh, you can already digest different explanations than uh, other people. So you should always tailor, tailor the explanation to a specific person. Okay, and then, yeah, what I would like to distinguish is also we, we can either explain a whole machine learning method, and this explanation could amount to telling you the data set, the model, and the loss, or the sign choices for them, or you explain a specific prediction. This is different. So you want to provide the explanation of a prediction means to provide information about how a certain prediction has been obtained for a certain data point. For example, you could say this prediction has been obtained since we use a linear map and the weights of this linear map are 10 and 4. Okay? So that's how you just could explain a particular prediction given a specific hypothesis. This is different from explaining the whole linear regression method. Another way to explain a prediction uh, is uh, natural for decision trees. So a decision tree is somewhat uh, self-explanatory. You predict for a data point uh, with features x, x, let's say the feature is 6, you get the prediction 2 because you use this decision tree. So an explanation could be just show the decision tree. Uh, what would you say? Uh, an explanation is also used uh, in the context of law. So when you get a, so I, I never did, just heard from friends, when you get a court decision, uh, it's always with an explanation of the decision. It's called the, the, the Spruch, Urteilsspruch. And what would you say, Diana, is this, is this uh, decision or justification of a court decision, is this more like this? So uh, stating the facts, this person has been guilty because this camera has uh, observed <laughs> this and that. Well, I'd say it's a little bit less clear cut. So you do have the facts that led to the decision, yeah. but you're going to have like a whole lot in the middle that is basically discussing the underlying rationale and whether you yeah. believe that something might have to be interpreted in a yeah. way. In this case, it's like yeah. a So in, yeah, in, in court, it's a, an explanation is just a, a, a text or a text document, a f a which is formalized to some extent, a formalized text document. So an explanation could also be a, a piece of text. Okay. Then another aspect uh, here is the communication. So this uh, uh, European guidelines tell that or suggest that AI systems should not represent themselves as humans to users. And this is done, for example, on Slack because you sometimes get these posts and there is something called the Slack bot and it clearly indicates itself, I'm a simple bot. So this is also a requirement. Next requirement, diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. Uh, yeah, here, one important thing is the avoidance of unfair bias. And one elegant way to do this is, for example, you want to predict the salary level of a, a certain job. So you, you, have, uh, you have a big company and you open up a new job for, for uh, let's say, a machine learning engineer. And you want to find out what is the best salary you should offer for this position. And you could use machine learning, of course, to predict the right salary level for this position. And then you could say, I look at uh, data points from previous uh, job offers or from the job market. You get this information maybe from Glassdoor or there are some job platforms which tell for this position you get this kind of salary. And then you could say, instead of training directly, you, you try to uh, augment the data set by using data points that differ in the gender. So you intentionally augment your data set by flipping the gender. So you want to have the same sal predict the same salary level, no matter if it's male or female candidate. So this is how you could implement fairness by requiring data augmentation. Okay, then another requirement is the accessibility. So it should not have uh, this uh, overall machine learning methods should not have a one size fits all approach. So this is more related to the user interface. And here we have, for example, Google is an example where you get uh, a tailored uh, user interface. It suggests an, a translation 
uh, for you. Another uh, aspect is stakeholder participation. So you should try to solicit regular feedback even after the deployment of your machine learning method. So this goes beyond these technical learning cycles. Uh, more in the long run, you, you should ask feedback from the users or the stakeholders. And this, I mean, maybe uh, you have seen such buttons in, in cafeterias, in university cafeterias. So this is one way to solicit feedback, stakeholder feedback. Are you happy with the food or not? So, IT services also have it, yes. Okay, next requirement, uh, the societal and environmental well-being. So here we, we should require measures, uh, we should use measures securing the in, in, environmental friendliness of AI systems. Yes, and here I see two aspects. First, the labeling of, data set, of the data points should, not be, uh, should be environmentally friendly. Let's say a data point is a, a certain chemical and the quantity of interest is What's, what's the effect of this chemical when it spills into, the, into a river? So, in order to get labeled data, you should not try out to spilling this chemical into a real river, but rather maybe simulate it. So, don't label data, don't, uh, don't uh, destroy nature to get labels for your data points. Another aspect is, of course, uh, this is related to the computational aspects of machine learning. You should try to minimize the required computational resources. Uh, you can almost not directly translate hours of cloud computing service that you need, for example, to run gradient descent to search over all possible hypotheses in your hypothesis space to uh, amount of or to the, to the use of, of natural resources. So there's this Google Cloud service which calculates the carbon footprint of the, the use, usage of computational resources. So the less you, you need to compute for the training of your model, uh, the more in, environmentally friendly you are. And if I remember correctly, there is now uh, this uh, prestigious conference for machine learning called NeurIPS, where you have to estimate how much, uh, what is the carbon footprint of the numerical experiments you have used for this paper. So they ask you specifically to state the carbon footprint. Okay, then uh, the social impact. Uh, so AI systems can be used to enhance social skills, but they can equally contribute to their deterioration. So here, one example that I would like to point out, which I just found, and I'm very happy that it is, there in uh, Outlook, uh, this web application for emails, now, when you try to send an email on the weekend, it automatically asks you the question, do you really want to send the email now or do you want to delay it to Monday? Uh, and I like this uh, feature very much because I'm, I'm not uh, too big of a fan to send work emails on weekends, although it's really hard to, to avoid this. Uh, yes. Then another a big example, of course, uh, Cambridge Analytica, where... Uh, there have been uh, uh, investigations if machine learning has been used to profile Facebook users and based on this profiling, uh, target advertisement to them. So to, to nudge them to certain uh, uh, candidates in, in elections. So there, it's this, uh, I don't know if it's a myth, if you can call it a myth, that Cambridge Analytica has been uh, used uh, or is the reason for the success or some of the reasons for Donald Trump uh, becoming president of the United States and for Great Britain to leave the European Union. So uh, I've seen there is still an open debate how, how really, um, if this was really crucial for these uh, uh, results of these votes or it's just, uh, just a bit of a marketing uh, using a lot of machine learning passwords. Okay, but one should be aware of the risks. That's, of course, a good example or a case to study potential risks of using machine learning on, on a larger scale. Yes, so the final requirement is accountability. And this is where I, I can tell you the least, because I understand it the least. But uh, what I have read, some uh, requirements are auditability. So establish mechanisms that facilitate the system's auditability. For example, the traceability of the development process, the sourcing of training data, and logging of the AI systems process. So this logging 
might be in, uh, relevant for self-driving cars because uh, the outcome of decisions for self-driving cars might be a car crash. And then you should make sure that you have a small recording box that stores all the parameters, the hyperparameters, and the last few bits of training data that have been used, or the most recent training data, for the prediction of the steering angle to find out why did the steering angle go wrong. So I guess there are examples from, from some uh, car manufacturers uh, where there have been crashes and they had to, I guess they, they, have, they had uh, audits then by the, by the law enforcement. Okay, and the last point, uh, yeah, due protection must be available for whistleblowers, NGOs, trade unions, and other ent entities when reporting legitimate concerns about an AI system. And this last slide, of course, uh, I would like to use to, to advertise or to motivate you to join a union. So a uh, union is maybe a, a core component of our European democracies. So please consider joining a union. Okay, yeah, by the way, what are the three main components of machine learning? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now we have a break till 10 past 11, and then we hear about the legal perspective of machine learning from Diana.
Okay, is it better now? Is it getting better? No? What about now? It works? The volume, but... Yeah. I like to turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, do you hear me better now? Is it too loud now? Better. Okay, okay, great. So, are there any questions regarding last time? I think the answer was more or less no. Okay, great. So, last time I basically showed you what are the limitations that we have from the data protection um, side. But I'd like to show you now how you can actually use the GDPR to do your planning and to get to trustworthy AI. So for that, you do have documentation requirements. All of you know that you have privacy policies on websites. Whenever you have a product that you want to sell, you will have contracts that also include data protection. Um, then I'll show you the scope of the planning and a little bit of the required documentation, just so that you have an idea when you actually have your own product on how to deal with it. Okay, so why do we need it? As you have seen beforehand, we have the different data protection principles. Can anybody remember some of them? Okay, we'll get to that. So we do have different principles based on which we are supposed to collect and use data. And to be able to implement them, we need to actually have a planning phase beforehand and make sure that we have thought of all possible impacts that we're creating. <clears throat> and also that relates to the idea of having trustworthy AI in the sense that if we want to be transparent and if we do not want to have any negative impacts on data subjects, then we need to also make sure that we have thought about them beforehand because we're obviously not planning to harm anybody, but there is a good chance that it happens if we don't plan properly. So, uh, in the planning involved should be all part of the life cycle of data and of our models. And that goes from the collection to the use, access, transfer, maybe that's better, um, storage and then also the destruction. So when we collect the data, we have already talked about this, um, then there is a lot of things to, to recognize. But what is the most important principle that we've heard many times when it comes to which type of data we're collecting? Yes, data minimization. <laughs> so the idea is that any kind of data that relates to an identified or identifiable person um, is personal data. And we're trying to limit the, the use of personal data as much as we can. So whenever we want to actually collect data, we need to ask ourselves, do we really, really need this information? And then also, what is going to be the purpose of the information that we're collecting? Because we do have the requirement to, at the point where we are actually collecting data, and at no point after that, already know what is the purpose, what is our legal basis, and how much data do we use. So for this reason, you need to plan in and ask what is the legal basis. The legal basis you will find in the GDPR. The most important ones are consent and the contract when you're providing a product. There's other ones as well, but they will probably not be used so much in a commercial purpose. We also have legitimate interest. You will see that in privacy poli uh, policies sometimes. But let's stick to consent. Consent is the idea of having an explicit will and having an affirmative action giving that. So when we think back about the privacy policies on the web, then we all click accept, right? But nobody reads it. Nobody actually knows what is the purpose of it. This is not consent. Consent is meant to be done by an informed person that makes a conscious decision about what they want and what they do not want. So when you are in the future have a product <coughs> or for any kind of purpose collect data, then make sure that whatever you give the information, uh, whatever information you give to the person is comprehensible and short in a way that they will understand what are you using that data for. Okay, then the use and access. The question obviously is what is personal data used for? Now, the GDPR is technology neutral. That means that you will not find many specific requirements for AI. In fact, there's only one, which is Article 22, that you have seen earlier when it comes to the right to explainability. 
Otherwise, you will have to adhere to the principles and everything else that could be applicable to you. So in our case, when we have Article 22, the requirement is that whenever there is a significant or legal effect on a person, they have the right not to be subjected to that if it's based solely on automated processing. So that is why we have this human aspect that Alexander introduced earlier. That is why we need to have that in, in mind when thinking about what are we going to do with the data. Because in, in that case, you will always have to make sure that at some point the data subject is allowed to come to you and say, I want to have an explanation of what you have done. And then you will have to be able to actually give some kind of document that says, this is how we have reached a decision. This is what the data that we have used. And this is what was the aim of it. <coughs> so that be uh, belongs to the right to access rectification and erasure. I think we've heard that quite a lot. But the data subject has the right to, at any point of time, come to you and ask for access to all the information that you hold about them. Oh, sorry. Um, and as asked for rectification and erasure of the data. So rectification basically just means that the data is outdated or it's not valid anymore, and they ask you to, to correct it. Then erasure is the right to be forgotten that I introduced to you earlier. And it's based, simply based on the idea that the data does not reflect the person anymore. And if you're actually evaluating characteristics of a person, then it should be allowed that that person comes to you and says, hey, this is not reflecting anymore. I do not want to have this kind of data about me anymore. And then there is uh, the right for them that you have to delete it. There is also other requirements. So whenever you really need it or there is a good purpose from your side, you can keep it. But this always needs like, to be identified in, in the specific case. And also what uh, Alex mentioned earlier, there is the need for strict access controls. Whenever you hold data and you use it, you need to make sure that only authorized people that know exactly what they're doing are actually having access to that data. And also that needs to be documented. You need to have an access policy that says people A, B that have this and this training beforehand have the authorization to have access. And you need to have logs of that. You need to always make sure that you have documented this. So transfers. Trans transfers is an amazing thing. The GPR is valid within the uh, European Union, but it also has effects outside of the European Union. So whenever you have the, somebody else from another country outside of the EU even only accessing your information, that is personal data, then this is considered to be a transfer of, uh, of, of data. <clears throat> and this transfer basically means that in this case, somebody from another country has only access to your data, but they had access. So you will have to look at the destination country and evaluate whether this country is giving you the exact same um, or similar enough equivalent protection as the GDPR does. So this is one of the reasons why there was so much hassle about the US. Because the US do have a data protection regime in place, but we're not only looking at data protection. We're also looking at surveillance measures. And in this case, it was found that the U.S. might have surveillance measures from the state side that we do not consider to be equivalent to what we in, the, in Europe consider to be safe. So whenever you have this kind of transfer, you will have to make a different risk assessment. And you will not only have to look into data protection, but you will also have to look into fundamental rights and into questions of surveillance. And in your practical life, you will have the possibility of using standard contractual clauses so whenever there is a country that is considered to be equivalent, the European Union issues an opinion that says these countries are equivalent, then you don't have much trouble. In all other cases, <clears throat> you will need to have an additional assessment of the safety of the information that you're using. Yes? So I've got a stupid question, but what <coughs> does it mean to transfer data outside the European Union? It's enough. It could be a, a real transfer. It could actually be that you have a disk and you ship it somewhere else, yeah, but it could this also... Is here, but but it, if I'm like a, a European Union citizen and have data in a cloud service, I don't know at all where, where it is to some extent, so it can be anywhere in New Zealand, my yes. data. So is this the... So it's not the data itself that is transferred, but the, the ownership. So the data is copied to some other service or storage which does not fall under uh, European legislation. See, this is the problem. Theoretically, in the, also in the cloud storage, you have to know the destination country. So, for example, when you use Amazon, okay. they do have data centers all over okay. the world, and you should know that. That's okay. not always the case, that you can know, but you should know, and then 
this is the destination country. Yeah, that is, by the way, also true for all other processors that you're using. So anybody that you have a contract with and can access your data is also under this regime and should be subjected to a risk assessment as to whether the country in which they are is actually fulfilling the requirements that we set to data or not. Um, are there any other questions about this? Yeah. Uh, um, is it, how far is it to actually know if a company is actually fulfilling all of this? Because at the end of the day, um, we as the legislator or the regulator, they don't have access to every step of the process that the information of that company goes through. So we don't actually know if that information, just like it's going to a European server, it's also going to a server in the US or in some other place. So in a way, uh, how can you actually know if that's being important? That's absolutely true. Um, so in the GDPR, we have the requirement of having uh, records of processing and of having all of this da uh, data uh, available. So whenever the legislator, or in this case the Finnish, uh, Finnish Ombudsman, would come to us and say, well, we believe that you're doing something wrong, we would have to give this information. And there is um, the standard of having GDPR audits on a frequent basis. They will ask these questions. But yes, you're absolutely right. There's nobody that is going to actually look into your systems. So, of course, you can cheat, but you shouldn't. Okay, storage and destruction is something that I believe is the one that is mostly not used by companies, and this is a huge problem. So the thing is that whenever you are um, about to use a system, in this case might it be a machine learning model, uh, you have to think about the safety of the data and the integrity of the data for the whole life cycle. So if you are thinking of having a product that is supposed to run 50 years, then you have to take the next 50 years, think of what is the possible technical development, and have to take these 50 years into account when deciding upon the safety measures. So this sounds ridiculous in many, many ways, and it's very difficult, I believe that. Um, but this is why you should always aim at having very high security standards when you are thinking of having a long-running system. Because the GDPR requires us to take into account the whole life cycle of the data that we're using. And if the life cycle is endless, then we have a problem. So the GDPR requires us to store personal data only as long as it is absolutely necessary. And it makes sense also when it comes to the requirement of safety. So please, whenever you're planning something, take into account how long do you actually have to store it. And here also be aware that when it comes to certain kind of data, for example, payment data, you do have other legal requirements. The GDPR is giving you the data protection side, but there might be a problem with anti-money laundering. There might be a problem with terrorism financing. And in these cases, there are retention periods that are actually already defined in the law, and you will have to adhere to them and can take them as the storage limitation. OK, so to the required documentation, what I have just led you through this whole cycle very quickly, I accept that. Um, so this whole life cycle is what we have in the GDPR. This whole life cycle is ruled upon in the GDPR. And you have heard a little bit about the, the principles earlier and today. But very importantly, when you have the first planning stage that Nitin introduced the other day in ethics, this planning stage is literally meant for you to go through the whole process of what are you going to do. And this has to be documented, and you need to have a risk assessment on that. So that means whenever you are thinking of, I am going to collect emails, you will have to think of, is this email absolutely necessary? Do I have a legal basis for collecting this email? Then how long am I going to store them? What am I going to do with them? And what is the, the risk that I am subjected to if my system is not actually safe? What is the risk that I'm subjected to if anything's ha anything happens to the data, or if the consent, for example, or the legal basis that I ha was given beforehand is not valid anymore after a certain period of time. Because consent is not something that is going to be valid for the whole life of a person. Consent is something that you will have to ask many, many times if you, if you have a long time of processing. So in these cases, you need to also make sure that in whatever system you have, you have the possibility for giving access, for destroying data, 
and you know where the data is. I think the biggest problem oftentimes is where is my data actually going? Yes. How is it seen if you fuse the data to train a model and then you have to destroy the data by a GDPR request? I guess you can still continue using the model, but is like there a distinction line because if I perfectly overfit the model, the data is kind of still there. Yeah, this is actually a very interesting thing. You're talking about the question, if I delete the data, um, but I have trained a model, does that still reflect the data? Um, in fact, this is, in legal discussion, not solved. So there is no real answer that I could give you right now. Any other questions? Okay, so what I have just told you is basically the basic idea of a data protection impact assessment. That is what you have to do. Whenever you use machine learning, you use, you, uh, you use new technologies, but also when you know that you're using behavioral or location data of a person. Basically, whenever you, are, you have the possibility of subjecting somebody to a high risk. Otherwise, there's obviously a lot of documentation that you would have to give evidence. Um, from the point of view, what does that help you regarding trustworthy AI? It literally just helps you to have thought about all the possibilities and to make sure that you, are, you can be transparent in all your operations. So the personal data protection policy is what you all already know. It's about informing the person so that they know what you are doing with the data, how long you're storing it, and, what you're going, uh, and how they can actually contact you. It's very important to always have a point of contact so that people can actually use their rights. Then the privacy notice, also from websites. Um, important, the data retention policy. You need to have that policy and you should adhere to it under all circumstances. But that is something that you have to plan when collecting already. Then the consent, as I said, always an explicit for uh, expression of a will. So even if you have a website and somebody just refrains from doing anything, this is not consent. It has to be an explicit action. It has to be a click on a yes. Um, by the way, it also has to be a click on a no. So what you're seeing in privacy policies nowadays, whenever you have cookie banners or all, any kind of banner or privacy policy, you have the yes being super easy to click, but the no being really difficult to find. That is inherently against the GDPR. Okay, so that is the data protection impact assessment that I have already talked about. Basically, the most important tool for you to ensure that you're GDPR compliant and you have the possibility of creating trustworthy AI. Um, supplier data uh, processing agreements are very important in the sense that this concerns the question, are you actually putting data outside of the EU where you cannot control the safety anymore? And therefore, you would basically have a problem with the integrity of the data. Then we have data breach. Um, so in Finland, we have the Finnish Ombudsman, uh, and they have an electronic system where you have to notify your data breaches. That is basically just to make sure that whenever data is leaked accidentally, you, they, you have the possibility to know as a person, hey, my credit card was just leaked, my information was leaked. So in these cases, you have the duty to actually report to, the, uh, to in this case, the Ombudsman within 72 hours that your system had a flaw, that your system leaked data, or that anybody unauthorizedly used it. And the transfer impact assessment. Um, I listed here some, I don't know in which stage of, of your uh, path in university you are, or if you have your own projects already, but what I listed is basically where you can find information on how do you conduct, uh, conduct a data protection impact assessment, um, what is the checklist for the GPR? It's very easy. You have a whole checklist on how am I using data and is that correct? And you can do basically all of that by yourself and make the pre-stage of planning. Yeah. Um, for the data breach notification, does the GDPR require me to connect an email address if I don't want to connect an email address to be able to notify? Because if I have a service that doesn't need email addresses but maybe still has sensitive uh, Actually, the reporting is done uh, to the government authority. Oh. So the reporting, basically in the report you will say, um, I had a security risk, somebody unauthorizedly used the service and downloaded five different spreadsheets. And in these five spreadsheets there was information regarding, maybe the, it's just a zip code and birth date, 
but you will have to send this information to, to the government authorities. So you do not have to um, actually have the possibility to go to every single person directly. But you have to inform the government and then they will decide upon the steps that are taken after. Okay, so um, as I said, there you can find like any kind of information that you might want to, to check when you're starting your own projects. Um, yeah, are there any questions otherwise? Yes? Um, when you say data protection, it's more when it comes to privacy of that data, or the fact itself of the company actually keeping that data? Because if you say that someone got a ransomware, but you're a company and you got a ransomware, you no longer have access to your data and you lose it permanently. Um, is, is all, does GDPR also fit in here? Yes, absolutely. So what is the outcome of the GDPR if that happens to you? is firstly that you have to check whether you have actually adhered to the GDPR because you do have the legal requirement to keep it safe. The integrity that Alexander introduced earlier is a requirement from the GDPR. You have to ha uh, ensure that the life cycle of the data is safe. And in your systems, you're encrypting, you're hashing, you do whatever you can to keep the data safe. And then the data breach uh, information that you have to the government, you also have to do it then. So because it does not only consist that somebody comes and takes it away, you know the person, but any kind of loss, destruction or unauthorized use that leads to this data being unsecure has to be reported through this data breach notification. Okay, I guess there are no other questions, then I'm going to give back to you. Thanks a lot. So, now uh, we have till 12, the lecture hall, so I will be around and uh, happily take any questions of you regarding the last steps of the summer school, which is uh, finalizing the project, writing the project report. Uh, also, I'm happy to answer questions regarding the, the lectures. Uh, yeah, I will be around till 12.